Tame the Chaos, Scale Your Sites and Business webinar. All right, there I am, staff reporter here working out of the Boston area for San Francisco-based CMS Wire. Been with the gang for about a year now and loving this web CMS space. It is hot, hot, hot right now. Uh, so, so many people are talking about it, especially in, when we get going with these articles and these comment sections, you, you should you check it out. All right, our agenda for you today. First five minutes, we'll go through the introductions, which we're doing now. And then 40 minutes, we'll get into the actual meat of the show, the presentation from Josh Koenig, co-founder and head of developer experience over at Pantheon. And then 15 minutes, we want to hear from you, live Q&A. And just remember, you can submit questions during the show that we will keep track of, and then we'll get to with Josh and I at the end of the show. All right, moving along. Again, like I mentioned, those questions, you can submit them uh, via WebEx. You can use those chat or QA models you see there on your WebEx screen. Or go to Twitter. Tweet us, at CMS Wire. Send us the question there. We'll be tracking that as well. And again, just a reminder, those, that chat function, you can see there where the arrow's pointing to the chat with the drop down. And you know the appearance may vary a little bit depending on what platform you're using, but just send the message to the all participants there and you can drop that down as well and have other options. But right in that little body of text, just send your question in there and again, we'll be tracking it for sure. Same thing with the Q&A, get your questions in there and uh, we will be tracking that and looking forward to having a lively discussion at the end there. If you think of a question before the Q&A session, just let us know and we'll definitely have that if we have time for it at the end. All right, and during the show, we have three poll questions that we're going to ask you. We definitely want you to be active in that and get engaged and tell us what's going on in your minds. It's gonna be fun to see the responses on those poll questions. Same, same way you can, it's gonna come up on the screen and you can just try to ask those poll, answer those poll questions right in that area there you see with the arrow. It's gonna be fun. All right, there we are, CMS Wire, founded in 2003. We got a lot of editorial contributors. We hope you're reading us every day and be, being part of our conversation, covering a lot of nice areas, customer experience, digital marketing, social business, enterprise collaboration, EIM, and of course, today's subject to web CMS. All right, so we know this, web, this webinar is sponsored by Pantheon, the professional website platform. Top developers, marketers, and IT pros use to build, launch, and run all their Drupal and WordPress sites. Pantheon powers 70,000 plus sites, including Intel, Cisco, Arizona State, University, and the United Nations. Check them out, www.getpantheon.com. Dot com. And speaking of Pantheon, our presenter, the star of the show, Josh Koenig, co-founder, head of developer experience at Pantheon, founder of Drupal Dojo, the first high-profile public Drupal use case with the good old Howard Dean campaign back in 2003. Awesome stuff there. Josh is also the co-founder of Chapter 3, the premier Drupal agency in San Francisco. Welcome, Josh. Thanks, Dom. Thanks for having me. Yeah, it's awesome to have you. So we are going to turn the panel over to you, Josh, now, and let you just take things away. Great. So um, our mission, uh, just to give you a little bit more background on where we come from and where I come from, uh, our mission at Pantheon is to power the world's websites. And uh, what we see is that already today, the primary means by which a business, an organization, or even an ambitious individual reaches their customers, their constituents, or their fans and followers is through their website. That's not really a controversial statement. Um, but the web is still an evolving medium. You know, we would expect billions more people to come online before the end of the decade, and the experiences and the interactions that they are going to have with businesses and organizations are becoming more in intricate, more complex, and, and actually, and more, most importantly, they're higher value. We see the future being that you know brochure 
hardware is dead and conversions are the new king. Content also really important for getting you conversions, but ultimately people are looking at the value they're getting from their website much more closely and those who derive greater value are winning the day. Um, and our role as a platform is to help you know businesses and organizations succeed in that environment, make it much easier for them to run killer websites. And we have an opinion about how you run a killer website and that's that you use an open source CMS. Um, the, uh, this is not just our opinion, it's sort of statistically, uh, there's an enormous trend away from custom website development and towards using open source CMS as the basis framework or primary means by, by which these things are delivered. Um, over the past four years, you know, the, the trend line of open source CMS growth and the decline line of custom CMS, they track almost one to one. So there's clear movement in the market in this direction, and we'd expect open source to hit 30% uh, of all websites, uh, open source CMS to power 30% of all websites by the year end. Um, that, if you look at how that breaks down in the, in the business market, there's sort of uh, the middle of the market is the hottest place. Pace. Down on the, the sort of the low end, the consumer end, you know, WordPress.com powers a lot of blogs. And at the very high end, the, the sort of very large enterprise WCM space, Acquia is actually doing a pretty good job of positioning Drupal as the open source alternative to the traditional enterprise um, web behemoths. But the, the middle of the market, which is really anything from I had to hire a professional designer or marketer because I don't want, want to just use someone else's template on up to, you know, we have a, an ambitious web build but it's not our flagship major implementation. Open source is, is, uh, is, uh, is really, really making a lot of headway right there in the middle of the market. And that's an exciting place to be. That's, that's kind of where we um, do most of our work. Um, and in that space, you see all tiers of companies making use of open source. So small businesses use it a lot. You know, they often don't have any legacy that they're dragging along with them, so they can just start with open source and go from there. Um, but moving on up in the markets, you see these large organizations you know, using it sometimes even for their big flagship sites, but also very frequently for campaign sites and, and product launches. And those are the kinds of things that actually, again, are driving that marketing value. Um, your flagship website may or may not be CMSs, uh, primarily WordPress and Drupal. There's a lot of data points out there that these are proven technologies and they're proven to scale. You know, whether you're the White House or Snoop Dogg, just pick two enormous use cases from, from opposite ends of the spectrum. These are real tools that major organizations are using and, and getting hip to. Um, so I think before we dive into why this is happening and then what the challenges are as, as the, the web moves in this direction, we wanted to do a quick poll question, Dom. And yeah, that would be... Absolutely. Absolutely, Josh. Thank you. And there it is. That's our first poll question, uh, which Josh has gone to. And that is, folks, and again, we want you to be engaged in this. We want to know what's on your minds. It will help our discussion greatly. Uh, the first question is, how do you currently use open source CMS? And the choices. A, we use open source CMS as one of many different solutions. B, we are standardizing on one or two open source CMSs, or C, we don't use our abandoning open source CMS. And you can answer the questions right there on the right in those poll questions. Just fire away and don't forget to hit submit too. That's a big part of that. We won't be able to see your answer if you don't hit that submit button. So uh, our host Candace is going to be watching those polls and Josh, um, you know, as she's doing that, what are we going to see here? Uh, you know, if we get a lively audience, that is, um, what are you seeing in the industry? I should say, uh, what would the industry answer for this one be? You think? Um, I think, it, I mean, given the title of the uh, webinar, I think it's unlikely that we're going to, um, you know, we draw a big audience of people who don't, who aren't even considering this or who are moving away from it. Um, yeah. I think it's going to be a mixture of A and B, but I'm pretty curious to see where people are at in terms of whether, uh, you, you know, I would. It's almost unheard of for a major uh, anybody who does a lot anything significant with the web to have no open source in their in their portfolio at all. Uh, and the real question is um, how um, how how much are people using it? Is it a, a mix of solutions, um, or are people still like kind of standing over across the room looking at it and deciding whether or not that's uh, that's the direction they want to go? Yeah. So we do have some results in here, folks. Thank you for taking the time to answer that. And for A, we use open source CMS as one of many different solutions. We got 20% there. B, we are standardizing one or two open source CMSs. We got 24% there, so a slight uptick. And finally, at 22% coming in was 
we don't use or are abandoning open source CMS. So really a, a split there, Josh, huh? Interesting. Well, that's a, that's a good breakdown. I, I hope in the group C, it's uh, people who are evaluating or if they're considering abandoning it, uh, maybe it'll be for the same reasons that I'll be discussing in terms of the, the challenges organizations run into when they do adopt open source and maybe we can turn some people around. Yeah, absolutely. All right, let's move on to slide 17, Josh, and continue on with the presentation. Thanks so much, folks. Sure. So I, I want to quickly run down the upsides um, before we get into the pain. So the, the reasons why people are, are moving towards open source and a lot of organizations are is that it's better than starting from scratch. You know, people don't want to reinvent the wheel. Um, it's very rare for a website product these days to be to be a true custom ground up build. Um, that's a lot of risk uh, and that's a lot of cost. Um, on the flip side, you know, with open source, you have infinite flexibility. You know, you can't innovate with a cookie cutter solution very well, um, and so you know, you want to be able to control your destiny. You want to be able to control the experience. You want to be able to own your data. You don't want to be locked into a particular vendor. Open source offers all those values. Again, it's, it's proven to be scalable. Um, this is something where you have millions of uh, users and millions of businesses and organizations behind it. There's a huge amount of momentum with open source versus if you think about a custom piece of software or a more niche proprietary. Uh, able to control your own destiny, you know, where the rubber meets the road is how can you, what do you do to get things done? Um, tech talent is like a hard problem for everybody. Tell, let me tell you, being in Silicon Valley, it's a huge challenge for us just recruiting. Um, but with open source, you have this ability to draw on a much wider pool of talent. There's a much larger uh, array of partners and vendors, and you can train up and do things internally uh, if you want to go in that direction much more feasibly than if you're on you know, something that is truly custom or a much more niche system. Um, and, and finally, you know, the open source keeps up with the rest of the internet. Uh, you, you don't have to rely on a small engineering team somewhere in internally or, or at a, a, a CMS vendor to bring you features that you can do it yourself and you'll also get a huge amount of uh, momentum just from whatever's hot online, someone's gonna build a, a plugin for it and you'll be able to, to get a lot of functionality for free. So those are all great reasons and those are all reasons why people are considering or moving to open source CMS. But why doesn't everyone use it if it sounds so great? Well, because the truth is that open source, it, it isn't free. Right, um, it's free as in speech, as they say, but not as in pizza. And you'll notice I didn't mention cost in the previous uh, slide. Um, open source, you know, one of the big challenges is that historically, if you want to use it, you end up owning the entire stack, and that's like everything from you're using your facing HTML in the web page to the LAMP stack and the server infrastructure behind it, and that's an enormous amount of ground to cover, and that can make it really expensive, especially to do correctly, because it takes a lot of energy to implement. Um, it might not take the most budget, but it, it takes a lot of time and expertise. Um, so this makes it difficult. The, the sort of um, uh, the, uh, the, the challenges that organizations run into, um, you have to figure out so many things just to get stuff up and running, and the number of decisions you need to make to be successful are enormous, and it can be quite daunting. Um, you know, a good IT organization or a good development team can certainly do this, and, and many of them do, but it can, uh, it's, it's not necessarily, especially for IT organizations, their top priority or uh, their number one ongoing concern to maintain all this stuff. And so, uh, really, it's the, the friction of, uh, of the difficulty and the, the cost that that entails is the biggest reason why people um, run into trouble or are worried about adopting open source, um, and th those are the biggest barriers. And uh, as I mentioned before, it's rare for people to have absolutely no open source in their, in their mix, but it's usually one of many solutions. And so the status quo is very fragmented. It's, it's kind of a mess. Um, you know, people have a variety of different solutions that were implemented a variety of different ways by different vendors at different times. Um, and what you end up with is, you know, with, without a lack of standard, with a lack of standardization, every project is a one-off. Um, and uh, even in cases where there is like an official way of doing things, it, it's often kind of like one of those like big overbuilt, um, you know, kludgy systems that has a lot of impedance to it. It doesn't meet the needs of marketers. Um, you know, there's a lot of uh, anybody who's ever had a, uh, you know, to deal with like a multi-week content freeze. I've actually heard of people who've had multi-month content freezes around a launch. That's just not a great position to be in if you're trying to innovate. Um, and so what you end up with is uh, people start going rogue. Right, uh, somebody's got to get some some results. Somebody's got to launch a campaign. Somebody's got to launch a new product, and they can't deal with whatever the status quo is in the um, 
in the in the in the organization, and so they just sort of go off the res and uh, start up. Uh, start up a, a, a new website on a new platform or a new infrastructure using a new technology. And the, the best and worst part is sometimes that's incredibly effective. And then you have a real winner, but it's another sort of oddball widget. And um, this is only going to increasingly be the case, right? As uh, more campaigns, more launches, and more programs mean more websites, the people who try to stand in front of that tide and slow things down are just going to get overwhelmed by this. You know, people are going to go around them. There's no way that you can prevent um, an increasingly diverse number of websites from being launched. That's just the way that the whole internet is trending. Um, and so, if you don't get ahead of this, you know, there's just a ton of waste. Um, fragmentation, you know, denies you efficiencies. It denies you economies of scale, and it creates a lot of risk. Right, a, a fragmented system is, an, by definition, an error-prone system. So you have just simple human error because there's like a lot of tribal knowledge. You know, who set this one thing up two years ago? Who has access to it? These slow everything down because you've got to navigate this very weird and fragmented map um, that developed organically over many years. Um, and you also typically um, when in, in this kind of environment, there are a lot of concerns or, or real problems around security or access control. And this is a major source of organizational friction, right? It slows down projects, it creates a lot of stop starts, um, and it puts people at odds with one another. I think this is actually one of the main reasons today that marketing and IT are often come to loggerheads. And I think with uh, platforms, the rise of platforms, that's one of the many things that I think um, we, will, we will see a change in, and that'll be great. Um, so given that I've now talked about sort of the pain here. I think we have another poll question just to get a sense of from the audience what their biggest headaches are, or if you're not using it currently, what your biggest concerns would be around open source CMS. All right, awesome. And thank you, Josh, for that. Again, we're here with Josh Koenig of Pantheon. And folks, this is a second poll question of the day. And just a reminder, we're going to have a Q&A at the end of this last 15 minutes or so. So right now you can go into that Q&A and ask your question. We will track it or even tweet to us at CMS Wire. We'll be tracking that as well if you have a burning question for us. Okay, so poll number two, we want to hear from you again. The question, what are your biggest open source CMS headaches? CMS headaches. Okay, the answers. A, traffic spikes and performance. B, development QA deployment fire drills. C, fragmentation between different solutions or D, security updates. And while Candace is getting the answers from you, you can go, by the way, go right into those poll questions, answer A, B, C, or D, and press submit. Don't forget, press submit so we can see your responses. Josh, I'll ask you <laughs> your biggest headache, um, what, or the, the latest headache, right? I mean, we are dealing with technology here, so something has to go wrong every day, right? Yeah, absolutely. I, I, you know, the... Um... Prior to starting Pantheon, uh, as I said in my bio, I, I helped build a, a Drupal-oriented uh, digital agency here in San Francisco called Chapter 3. And I've seen all of these things, you know, up close and personal, working with clients. Um, so, you know, there, there's no shame in having any of these pain points. These are the sorts of things that everyone struggles with. Um, I think uh, right now, internally, in my own world, I'm actually uh, – Probably C would be the the biggest pain yeah. point that I feel. We're trying to um, to reorganize and standardize, you know, how we do our um, our documentation for developers and our blog, and then try to get, you know, um, we have uh, some uh, uh, you know landing pages that we run for our marketing campaigns, and trying to bring more sanity to all those systems. And you know, and it's even even we who are trying to solve this problem globally struggle with this, you know, as a marketing organization. It, it's not easy. Yeah. All right, well, we do have some responses in here. Uh, for A, traffic spikes and performance, uh, we have 4%. For B, development QA deployment fire drills, uh, we heard from 18% of you. C, fragmentation between different solutions was 31%, so that was our highest. And then security, we got a low, low response there, just 2%. So uh, what are you seeing in those responses, Josh? 
Well, I, I think that's good. I mean, first of all, if I I would imagine, I don't know for sure because you know we we just met today, but I would imagine if I had given the same webinar or we had done the same poll, you know, three three or four years ago, traffic spikes and performance might have been a much bigger problem because I think that was a pain point that a lot of people were feeling, you know, right around the end of the aughts and the beginning of the teens, especially with open source CMS. Um, you know, there were examples of people who were doing it successfully at scale, but a lot of folks were struggling with that. And thankfully, we've solved most of those problems. That is not a problem that really anybody, you know, it's a problem that anyone, anyone can run into, but it's not a problem that someone should struggle with because those are largely solved problems. Likewise with security. Security is obviously always a big deal on the internet, but we, one, one of the benefits of moving in this direction is being a part of a, a large community means that you have access to a lot of expertise and so forth around securing your website. So those are really good things. Um, and then I'm not surprised that like my pain <laughs> mirrors the pain of the audience. That's good to know. And also that the, you know, now that we've, the, the one of the biggest challenges with open source CMS is, you know, how, getting it up and running is a big enough challenge, but then what do you do to actually continue, um, you know, keeping your website fresh, operating with it? How do you really realize its potential of being able to hire contractors, bring in vendors? That makes a lot of sense to me that people, people run into those kinds of issues because they're not problems that open source itself solves. They're, they're problems that you just get when you try to make use of it. Yeah, it makes sense. Uh, Josh, just thinking here, you know, you mentioned you worked with the Howard Dean campaign in, in 2003. What was your biggest headache at that point, and particularly on one particular day where, uh, <laughs> where, <laughs> where, where Dean, uh, Dean's infamous awkward scream, yell, fist pump thing uh, came out? <laughs> No, that was that was that was a meta problem that really didn't have much to do with our technology, unfortunately. So there wasn't anything we could do to fix it. Um, <laughs> but I, I, uh, you know, the biggest problems that we had, and that was extremely. I mean, that was that was more than ten years ago. That was uh, when doing these big fundraising pushes. You know, it was a, it was always a, a challenge to try to make sure that the infrastructure would hold up because it's a huge problem, right? That's the, this, it's one of the reasons it makes for a great learning use case, but it's, it's just an enormous challenge, right? You're literally getting a lot of traffic because people want to give you money and then your website fails, which means they can't complete the transaction. And that's just the worst thing that can possibly happen. So we got a lot of uh, sort of trial by fire on that and, and some really great learnings came out of it. I'll bet. All right, let's move on now, Josh, to slide 21. All right. So I want to talk through an imaginary use case of how the, the fragmentation challenge and the development challenge kind of play out in practice. Um, so let's suppose that you have three websites. Uh, let's suppose that you have a blog, you've got a developer knowledge base, and you've got a flagship uh, www website. Now, because these were all implemented at different times and maintained, if they still are, by different teams, they're scattered across several infrastructures, right? So uh, in, our, in our imaginary example, the company blog is on Amazon because that's where it got built by the internal dev team and it, because it was quick to set up, let's say. And they also run development environments for the knowledge base site and the blog there because because that's where they originally got them set up and it, you know it's a bunch of work to move it and, and they're just sort of sitting on Amazon and it, and it works well enough they say um, meanwhile the knowledge base because it was implemented by a vendor um, is on Rackspace okay and that Rackspace in infrastructure because it's like not being utilized super heavily the IT department also put QA and staging environments for the blog and the flagship site there because they, they had the, had the resources to spare um, nobody actually seems to know where the QA environment for the knowledge base is um, but people say, well, that's okay because we don't, you know, we just add articles to it. We're not doing that much development. We don't really need a QA site. There might have been one at one time, but maybe it got lost. Now, um, the flagship website is, of course, still on the internal IT cluster, um, and nothing else can be there because it's on a total lockdown, and it kind of makes it difficult to deploy there. Um, and while there's the staging instance of the flagship site on Rackspace where people can review things, the only working station or their laptop, and though, so that makes Susan here a bottleneck for all changes, and everyone's worried about the issues that might come up because Susan's laptop is actually fairly different infrastructure-wise than the, the full IT cluster that it's managed on, and uh, you don't want to have this like, oh, it worked on my machine discussion when you deploy something to production and it doesn't work as expected. Um, okay, so that's your status quo. And meanwhile, you've got an urgent product launch coming up in six weeks. Where does that go? 
Um, and this is this is only I mean it, I've slightly dramatized uh, the use case here, but I would imagine that folks in the in the audience probably uh, at some level here are nodding their heads. You know I've seen um, both in terms of looking at people that have, have migrated onto our platform, but also in my consulting days some uh, some really Rube Goldberg esque architectures. You know where um, you know especially when you have larger organizations, once you have larger teams, or if you have especially multiple different teams that have a, quite a few people on them, um, the what they end up with as an, it, while they're trying to collaborate and work together makes this dramatized example look like synchronized swimming. Um, I've seen things you wouldn't believe, and at some point you kind of just say, I'm not even mad, that's just impressive. Um, so, so this is the, the sort of the current state. This is the chaos that we're trying to tame. And uh, we believe that platforms are the answer to this kind of problem. Um, an organization does not need a website. An organization needs the capacity to launch many websites. And that's what a platform does for you. Um, you know, you can, you, you, you tame the chaos by defragmenting um, and you don't defragment. It's probably not realistic for, for m most folks to defragment into a similar or, or a single giant um, one website to rule them all kind of system, but you can legitimately defragment onto a platform. So, um, the uh, uh, the and and the good fl platform will let you realize the full value of open source, all the upside, all the things that we talked about. Platforms will make that easier um, for you as an organization. They'll help you drive consistency and standardization, and they'll actually have the effect of accelerating your team um, rather than getting in the way with the kind of one size to f or one website to rule them all kind of uh, situation. A platform can make everyone move faster and feel better about working together, um, and that's basically because the platform model lets you separate. Your your concerns properly. So you can abstract away all the infrastructure problems so that you don't have to task your web team um, with those things. You don't have to constantly bother IT. Um, and it also helps you run multiple websites with multiple teams in parallel. That's what a platform should do for you. Um, and this is a pattern that's emerging across the industry. Um, and we think as more people adopt platform style solutions, um, they're going to get more and more value from open source CMS. And we're going to continue to see the rise of uh, of open source CMS as a share of the available market. And um, how this plays out, as you can imagine, we have a nice sort of cleaned up version of the same situation, right? So um, everything is consistent, and the answer to where the next site launches in, is obvious. That's great. Um, and you have, uh, you know, there's there's no question about where a development environment li might live. Every site has a QA or staging environment. It's uh, very easy to add new environments, and all these environments are consistent, so that you don't have um, sort of heterogeneity among your team, where you know someone is working on their laptop and nobody has any visibility into how that work is progressing, and there's no um, solid assurance that when the work that they've done there moves, you know, out into the production environment that it'll work exactly the same way. Even with um, the rise of virtual machines inside people's laptops and so forth, there's just a ton of uncertainty that's created there. A platform um, accelerates uh, the, the, the work of the team by giving them um, the tools they need to develop, and it also helps them work consistently. Um, and so the, the, the value proposition here, in contrast to the chaos, is fairly obvious. And a lot of people out there, a lot of companies out there that do managed hosting or, or, or that are just service companies are kind of positioning themselves as platforms now. Um, so there, if you pay attention, there's a fair amount of cloud washing, uh, quote unquote cloud washing that's happening where people say, oh yeah, we're the cloud. Oh yeah, we're a platform. Um, but a key, few key questions to ask when you're evaluating uh, a, a someone as a platform is like, do they offer true consistency between the environments um, very, very frequently? Like because they want to be able to handle uh, scale, the production environment will actually be different than the other environments. That's a big red flag. That probably means they're just running some traditional hosting infrastructure behind the scenes and they're not really giving you a true platform. You could ask yourself, um, how long does it take to launch a new website? If it's not super turnkey to launch a new website or onboard a new developer or offboard a, a developer in, in the case where you need to like, you know, let someone go or they move on, um, that's a good signal that it might not clearly be uh, a platform. And finally, like if you look at the proposal from a vendor and and it just said you know you can tell from the proposal that they're they're passing on ec2 instances or or rack space or just some server hardware that's probably a red flag too um 
So just a word to the wise when you're evaluating platforms. Uh, and the point here is that with a platform, you are able to meet your marketing goals while also relieving the burden of the IT organization or, 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 or whoever handles that for you. Um, if you choose well, you're going to get a ton of value. Um, you're going to have a consistent way to manage your entire website portfolio. And that's the kind of the pattern that we see, again, emerging within most organizations that it's not just about one website, it's about their web portfolio. Um, you're going to have consistency and you're going to have turnkey, the ability to quickly launch things, to quickly start up a new project. And the time it takes you to do the conference call, to kick things off with your vendor, the, the sandbox can be up and running and your, your team is actually moving from that point rather than waiting a week or two or four to get sort of lift off. Um, you know, this makes your, uh, your, because you have consistency, you'll be able to train people on a common set of procedures, a common set of best practices. Um, it'll make it easier when you bring new people on. It'll make it easier to interact with vendors. And this basically makes things much more efficient for your organization. Not only are you able to get lift off more quickly, you can accelerate and work together uh, much more rapidly. Um, and all of that adds up to, a, a, you know, the, 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 where the rubber meets the road again is, can you get your new campaigns off the ground? Can you launch uh, things around, you know, whatever events, products, um, special projects, whatever it is in your business or organization that you're using the web, however you're trying to engage a larger audience to help grow your business, your cause, your personal brand, whatever it is, you'll be able to do that much faster. And 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 this is the, you're, getting, you're starting to see those benefits uh, again from uh, adopting open source. Open source plus a platform means that you really can drive velocity and agility from your web team. And then finally, like you should really solve all of IT's concerns. Um, you know, a platform will manage security for you. It'll handle backups. It'll be highly available. Um, it'll be fast. It'll scale to handle a lot of traffic. Um, you know, with a with a with a platform, you don't need to do a fire drill every time there's a major internet security scare, like Heartbleed or or Shellshock or this Drupal get in thing. The the idea is that all that stuff will just kind of be handled for you, um, and that lets your um, your t IT organization or your your sysadmins, if you have any, focus on what are probably higher value things to the business that they could be doing, not sort of running around uh, uh, to deal with the latest snafu from the website. Um, so just a quick to quick talk about why performance and scalability and uptime are so important. Um, I think, you know, as we've talked about, not a lot of people are worried about uh, traffic spikes. Um, and oftentimes dealing with that, though, historically has required a lot of expensive and rare expertise. Um, you means tapping into a niche part of the ecosystem if you're doing something custom. And that's something that, you know, folks have struggled with historically. A good platform eliminates that as a problem, which is really a, 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 a big deal. You don't, you don't, um, you don't want to have to be constantly taxing um, you know your most senior developers or your IT department um, to handle traffic spikes um, the other thing is that uh, performance like the actual speed of the website is absolutely critical to a good customer experience there have been study after study showing you know different things at different times but basically the faster your website is the more people love it and the slower your website is the more they'll bounce away and not engage with you they won't convert um, so and and this is increasingly important especially also as more and more of the web usage goes mobile people are on you know slower internet connections from their phones um, so oftentimes and also the the rate at which they're able to uh, render a web page if like one asset is hanging and that can like leave the whole web page not showing for them. And if it takes more than a second or two, they're just going to say, eh, I'll go and look at something else. Um, so the platform, again, should handle all that for you and make sure your sites are blazing fast. Make sure you can handle a sudden surge in traffic so that you don't have to fear success. You can take advantage of those big moments um, and that, that you can uh, enjoy great uptime um, you know, over the long haul. Security is probably a big concern with IT. It doesn't seem like it's a big concern for this audience. But again, that's one of the things that you know it should be top of mind uh, for, for everybody. And, and if just think about it, right? If your website is slow, it's never going to be that popular. If you crash the first time you get a traffic spike, you'll never be able to build sustained traffic. If you have sustained traffic, then you suffer brand damage from downtime. Uh, and that means that's like, you know, when we were trying to uh, do campaign financing or ca uh, campaign drives, um, if you've got that sustained traffic and you fought tip over in your moment of glory, there's a really major cost to that, not just in brand damage, but in actual lost business opportunities. Um, 
Um, so uh, all of these types of concerns should be uh, going away with uh, with a platform when you're using open source. Um, and get to get more into what some of the people are talking about um, with uh, the development QA deployment uh, fire drills. The other things that uh, uh, the other real benefit you're going to see from a platform is that it's going to make working sane, right? So it's not just about your production environment. It's how your team works together to create the website that is uh, meeting your business needs. That's super awesome. Um, you know, you get that tr you basically turn turnkey access into actual product velocity via workflow. So you should have a solid way to develop, a solid way to test, and a solid way to deploy so that your launch events no longer, they're not like a, a jaw clenching white knuckle thing that everyone stresses out about and keeps people awake at night. You should, launching should be something that you feel confident about and that you celebrate and that you do on a regular basis. That's how you win at the web. Um, and you can only get that way if you have tools to do it and that those tools are consistent. So right, again, no more, it worked on my machine, that platform should get rid of that problem, and everyone should have you know, the ability to, to deploy. Those, are no, those shouldn't be like uh, special skills that only certain folks have that require you know, a, a terminal to be open and like a bunch of Red Bull to be drank. It should actually just be easy. Um, the other thing is, if uh, because a platform is accessible and transparent to all the team members, if you're working together on a platform, this eliminates um, mysteries around not just why things are working or not, but also around mo more mundane stuff like your project status. You know, you're a lot less uh, likely to have these kind of Heisenberg frustrations, but also you're a lot less likely to have unpleasant surprises, right? Whether things are on track or not, if you're able to see the work in progress and communicate as a team, you can, you know, you, you can uh, manage manage deadlines, you can manage expectations. One of the, the most frustrating things uh, for, uh, for owners of websites is often that they just don't know what the status of the project is. And that's because the, of the, uh, one of the downsides of fragmentation isn't just that the production environments are scattered all over the place. There's an exponentially larger amount of fragmentation in terms of where the work is actually being done. And that creates a, just a ton of friction inside organizations and platforms can help solve that. Um, and then finally, you get the ability to realize the potential of the ecosystem. So the op the value proposition of open source is, you know, in one part that you don't have to start from scratch, but in another part, it's very much about that there's millions of people in the world that you can tap into that know how to use this stuff, that know how to build with, and that there are maybe not millions, but hundreds of thousands of people that are truly experts. Um, but the uh, without the question is how do you engage those people and where do you work with them in the same way that open source you know the code is just a you know a bunch of bits you have to run it somewhere you have to you know a platform will help you do that or if you're on your own you have to own the whole stack the real question of how you engage the ecosystem around open source is one that a platform helps you solve. Because again, you have a place where you're doing your work together. Um, you have a common system for on-ramping people and a, and a really simple way to off-ramp people when necessary as people move around to different projects. It helps you leverage all the different vendors. It helps you feel good about using subcontractors. Um, it helps you ramp up new hires or train people internally. Um, and, and this is like comparable to the uphill battle that often it feels like to get someone access to an internal IT system or just something that was set up years ago by someone who maybe is no longer around, if this is even possible. Um, that can be an, a, a, you know, a really frustrating process and it can suck the life out of a project. Um, or on the flip side, like there's a plenty of organizations where somewhere there's a spreadsheet that has all the passwords in it and who gets shared, who do, who do you share that with and how do you know who has access to what? That can cause a lot of heartburn um, within a security-minded organization in addition to being just an impediment. Um, and so uh, that's sort of the, the, the sum in total. I, I kind of put it that like um, uh, plat open source and platforms go together like peanut butter and jelly uh, because all the values that people want to see with open source, um, you know, open source software, it's just code that sits there. And an open sor source ecosystem is just people in the world. And a platform is the thing that connects all these things together. Um, so I believe that we have one more, yeah, we have one more poll question. Um, so, you know, Given that there, if you could forget the pain, um, what do you find most attractive about open source CMS? Like, what are people really interested in in, uh, in getting access to? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Josh. And that it, the answers for that one are a total control over web experience without reinventing the wheel. B access to a large pool of talent and vendors. C keep pace with innovation on the web in general. 
and D, no licensing costs. So you can go to the poll questions there, A, B, C, or D on the right side of your screen. Just pick your answer and then hit submit. Don't forget to hit submit. And we're moving uh, closely now to the Q&A session. And don't forget, you can go right into that Q&A tab there on your WebEx uh, portal there and ask us questions. Definitely still have time here for Josh. So we're going to wait for the results to come in. Um, what would you answer, Josh? Oh, so I think for me, it's it's a it's sort of a race between A and B. Um, I feel that uh, you know the having control over the web experience that's how you differentiate yourself, and that's so important um, for for anybody who's got an ambitious use case. And and, and I, I should also say, also total control over your data as more and more business systems integrate with the web and those customer interactions become more and more valuable. The ability to, to know that you've got control over your data and you can integrate it with anything is just huge. Um, I think that there's a lot of, I get nervous whenever people are like talk about how they, they don't know whether they'll be able to port their data from one system to another or whether they can integrate it. That's a, that's always kind of shaky. But the other thing is again, that ecosystem. Um, and, and I may be biased because I've been a part of that ecosystem for, for most of my career, but the, the value there um, of, uh, of the communities that exist, um, the open source communities that are contributing all this sort of free functionality to these systems, and then the even larger professional ecosystems around those open source communities. Um, you know, for people who are looking to get things done on the internet, having all that to tap into is just a huge level up. Yeah, and the uh, in kind of a landslide here, the total number A, total control of web experience without reinventing the real takes it at 24% for this for these answers, and B, Access to a large pool of talent and vendors was at 7%, and, and C, keep pace with innovation on the web in general, was at, um, was at 9 and then the final no licensing cost was at 7 so there you have it. Yep, and I think, you know, the, the, the A is the value, that's the win, right, and B is more a means to an end, um, so that makes some sense. Awesome. So this is just to wrap up, right? The, I'm gonna. It, it's good. It's it's good that the that was the winning answer. You know, the the way you, you get wins for your organization is that you can stay in control of the web experience. You can run any code you want. You can you know you you can avoid falling behind the times because you're on some old crufty one-off that you know no longer is has any life in it um you can improve the velocity of your teams while simultaneously re reducing errors so that's a huge one right because if you can move faster and make fewer mistakes then again that's how you get to launching more and that's how being in control of the web actually yields uh, value back to the business. Um, and a good platform, one of the things I didn't talk about but is definitely true, is uh, when you're working in this way together, you can reuse common assets across multiple projects. You know, whether that's your design template or your, your common branding assets or certain pieces of content. Um, preventing yourself internally from reinventing the wheel beyond just leveraging something that the world is building with open source CMS is also a big win. That's how you get efficiency. That's how you get consistency. Um, I've seen a lot of like the organizations that have really enormous portfolios like uh, universities, you know, they really struggle with this where they're trying to keep the web presence of the university fresh um, and up to date and in compliant with their brand guidelines, but they have such a decentralized system where every department gets to do its own thing. It can be a major challenge. It's one of the things we're helping a lot of them solve with our platform. Um, and, and most importantly, a platform should really put you back in control. You should, if you've tamed the chaos, your, your empire can expand without it feeling like it's just running amok um, and that you're, you know, you're sort of riding on the edge of sanity as this, as this stuff goes on. I think uh, a lot of people are, you know, looking at a future as similar to what I'm describing, where it's not just about one web website anymore. It's about many websites. It's about having a portfolio. And there's sort of, you know, maybe three takes on that. There's probably some people that are deny that that's the future and still think one website to rule them all will work for a business. And they may be right for their use case, but I think that the trend is going uh, away from that. And then there's people who look at that future of a, a lot of websites, a lot of launches, a lot of teams, a lot of, a lot of projects, and they either are really excited about that because it's finally like they're going to be set free and they can go out there and kick some butt on the internet or they're kind of terrified um, because it sounds like a lot of work and a lot of risk so um, hopefully uh, what, what I can bring to you uh, you know to the audience today is that if you can move towards the platform style solution you can embrace that future and see a lot of value and uh, and have a lot of fun um, while getting great results all right excellent
Thank you so much, Josh Koenig of Pantheon, for that uh, presentation. And we're now in the Q&A session of the webinar. And folks, don't forget, Q&A module right there. You can see that on your WebEx screen there. Just go right into that Q&A and ask us what you want to ask. Or you can also go to at CMSWire uh, and tweet us there. Maybe even team and, and get maybe use that hashtag. That's a pretty cool hashtag for us, isn't it? Tame the chaos. Hashtag tame the chaos chaos awesome stuff all right so we are going to go to our questions uh first one is from dan and going back to an earlier slide talking about uh josh you were talking about the cms adoption rates versus proprietary um earlier and dan just wanted to know that what the source of that uh information was if you have that off the top of your head oh yeah of course so that's um uh, a uh the w3 techs web crawler survey and they are they've been around for a long time and they they just uh uh have a, a number of different crawlers massive um amount of data about websites and and servers running on the internet and then they produce kind of aggregate results and you can subscribe to them for more detailed results i just took their i've been watching their aggregate results for uh for a few years now because i think it's very very interesting and i should point out that it, the the slide that we showed it wasn't um open source versus proprietary it was open source versus um custom um and that's uh or in their parlance uh none because when you look at they you know they, they examine something like a several hundred million websites and uh, and do what they can heuristically to determine you know what's powering them and um, when uh, you look at something so a lot of proprietary systems in at that scale look like custom systems or like no identifiable CMS because a lot of the proprietary tools that are out there are actually not used by large enormous numbers of uh, of, uh, of customers um, and so that's one of those things that kind of people are weighing as they as they think these things through you know open source versus uh, versus a uh, a proprietary system or a system that my, my vendor is bringing to me you know how many other folks are using this stuff what's the long what's the longevity for it how much innovation is there really in that space um, it used to be that you know because there weren't so many mature open source options you kind of had to go custom to, to get a lot of things done that's decreasing the case and I think that's really what's driving that general trend which I would assume will continue over the coming years thank you very much Josh our next question comes from Chris, and the question is, how do you manage knowledge transfer so that internal employees can maintain the code that a consultant wrote if there are issues with it later on? So there's there's a number of different ways uh, to approach this question. You know, the most uh, the most critical one, I think, from a developer standpoint, um, is actually to make sure that there's uh, the code is well uh, commented. Um, and you know, you can write up documentation, um, which is which is good, and I think that's good. And I think you can do a bit of pair work, like a, a great um, uh, sort of proof of concept is before the consultant uh, moves on, do something together with part of your team to just to make sure that you can actually get a new feature launched with your internal team and the consultant can be there to answer any questions as it goes on but the 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 the, the truly most valuable documentation and you'll see this within the open source projects over the uh, the major cms projects and, and others over the past few years has been a huge move to really put a ton of commenting and essentially put the documentation in the code so that when a developer is inevitably digging through something to try to figure out how it works the the documentation is right there and they're not trying to you know reference a, a wiki page that was written at you know at a different time than the code is written I think that's one of the biggest ways to, to do it excellent thank you and just a reminder we are in the Q and a uh, section of the pres of the webinar and we're here with Josh Koenig of Pantheon Dominic Castro of CMS wire and just don't forget go right into that Webex Webex portal right there Q and a hit that tab and ask us your questions or you can tweet it to us. We'll be following that at CMS wire. Take advantage of Josh's time here for sure. All right, Josh, next question comes from Alan. Um, are there any CMSs which address mobile first or even have app templates that are provided? So I uh, I know that there are some uh, newer fangled SaaS 
um, CMSs, uh, very lightweight SaaS CMSs that are mobile first. I can't remember the name off the top of my head, but I think that those are often, I mean, that's, and that's clearly a hot space, right? That's where that's a mobile is, is just enormous for, for the market. Um, it's, um, it can be uh, tricky to utilize those things. Because again, when you're talking about kind of a, a, a cookie cutter template thing, um, you know, it, it, that may or may not be a long-term solution or may not, may not give you the flexibility you need um, for your project. On the open source side, um, neither WordPress or Drupal right now are mobile first out of the box, but the beauty of these systems is that there are, um, you know, a number of different mobile design themes. Um, there are for people who want to use things to, to sort of uh, have a more web app style experience, there are existing plugins and modules. So it's not like, you know, obviously if you're trying to build an app or you're trying to build an innovative mobile first experience, a lot of that is up to you as an organization and what you want to get across to your users. But um, with uh, making use of open source, there are the, a lot of the common problems that are not distinct to you, your users, or your use case have actually been solved. And so there's a, there's there's a lot of ways to get get rolling very quickly just by picking the right starting blocks um, for your open source system. Awesome, thank you, Josh. And back to the Q and A Q. Uh, Dan rejoins us again. Thank you for your second question, Dan. Awesome stuff. What are some of the determining factors when choosing between WordPress and Drupal? So this is a question we get asked a lot. Um, uh, I have, a, you know, if you remember from my bio, I've got a lot of experience and background in the Drupal community, but as a platform, we uh, are wholeheartedly supporting um, both of these uh, tools. And, uh, and I think that it's a question really of the right tool for the job at the right time. There's a few things that determine that. Um, one of the first things I would ask is, you know, where is your expertise at? Because the truth is that unless you're you're uh, uh, very very far at one end of the use case spectrum or the other, if you have uh, experience, expertise, and skills in one of those but not the other, pick the one you know. Uh, the tool that you have expertise in and that you have mastery over is going to serve you better than the one that you're learning from scratch. Now, if it's kind of a wash or you're you're looking at uh, 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 you've got some expertise in both, um, then the way to determine it, in my opinion, would be um, looking at the complexity of your data model and how much you want to really build sort of a database driven website um, or, or uh, and that would sort of tr trend you towards the Drupal direction where you are going to have a lot of custom user inputs and listings of outputs um, versus something that's more of a, a content driven website, um, which is probably going to lend uh, some weight to the WordPress side of the equation. Um, it's a, like a little bit of a lighter weight system and there's a little bit more, um, uh, it's a little bit easier to work with from a design standpoint. Um, but the, the problem on the WordPress side is if you want to build a really big database style um, experience that's going to be pulling in information from all these different sources and letting people search through it and do all that kind of relational database stuff, it's not as strong um, uh, uh, for for those types of use cases, but I think the first thing to ask yourself is, you know, do you do you have expertise in one or the other? And and if not, then the question is, you know, which side of that spectrum of use cases do things fall on? Um, the the interesting thing is that the uh, I think that their uh, WordPress and Drupal are, are in many ways converging. Um, you see, WordPress is going to be adding; they're both adding REST APIs uh, to be part of this more you know ecosystem oriented approach for CMSs, and you see. Um, a lot of the, the new development in Drupal happening to sort of make it easier for designers to build uh, templates on top of it and make it easier for content editors. And on the flip side, on the uh, for, for WordPress, they're, they're sort of becoming more, they're, they're trying to become something that can be a true application framework, which is kind of where Drupal's been for a while. So over, it'll be very interesting to see over the coming you know, year or two or three how that pattern plays out and, and you know, whether, whether these develop into more niches in the future or whether they converge on sort of the common middle ground of those use cases. Josh, thank you for that response. Uh, just a reminder, the Q&A uh, portal right there in the WebEx um, stream there. You can go right into the Q&A drop down and ask us questions right here live or tweet. If you're more comfortable with the Twitter, go to at CMS wire, ask us those questions for Josh. All right, back to the Q&A portal. Now, next question is support is a big issue between choosing open source or going other routes. What's the reputation for support when it comes to open source? Well, so I think that the uh, one of the challenges here is that um, open source 
doesn't have a vendor uh, behind it. You know, most of the big open source projects have vendors that are associated with it, but it's not like you're buying uh, a it's not like the traditional model where you license some software and the software itself comes with an 800 number um, or a, a an email address or or a support you know ticketing system that you can utilize. You're you're um, part of what uh, the open source is just the code and the question for support is largely one of how you implement it. Um, so then I think that the, uh, how you address this, I, obviously I have an opinion and a bias that the platform model um, uh, has a lot to offer by removing all of the sort of infrastructure and plumbing style support from, from the equation. That's no longer something that you have to deal with. And so your question for support is now mostly around uh, developer best practices. Now, um, there are a lot of resources out there for development best practices and figuring out how to make a great website, how to how to continue to 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 improve it over time. And those are things that are, you know, you're a lot of that stuff is about um, building great experiences and that stuff you're going to need expertise and to do a lot of hard thinking around um, uh, anyway, you know, even if you go with a, a problem of building a great, wonderful website, the resources you have available to train you and support you on that are manifold. You can find someone maybe, you know, who's actually local to you, who you can meet with in person. You can find people who have, you know, really deep expertise in your specific industry or the style of experience that you're trying to develop. And you're not, you know, that's actually much higher value support and much more interesting support than kind of like having a ticketing system where you can send something into if something goes wrong. Um, I feel like that kind of classic um, uh, call center style support doesn't provide very much value to anyone anyway, and it's more like a security blanket. Uh, if you have a good platform, you know, you don't need that end or if there is something wrong that the platform will, will handle that stuff for you. And you can focus the question around supporting your web, your, your website on the, the, how do I get the most value out of this, not how do I troubleshoot something that seems to be misbehaving. Thank you, Josh. Uh, back to the queue with Chris again. Chris asks, our developers don't know PHP very well. Maybe only one of them has a lot of experience with it. So will we need a lot of help with Drupal, even if we go with Drupal 8? Um, I think that... Uh building the the skills will definitely take some time you know there's a learning curve to all these things and if you don't have it's not necessarily a a, a big drawback if you don't know php super well now if you have good developers they can pick up php very quickly and in some ways um by not knowing uh, PHP, they'll be able to pick up the sort of modern best practice PHP more quickly than someone who's got 10 years of experience with some of the, the more antiquated ways of doing PHP. Um, but I would expect that there's a learning curve and I would look at getting someone who can help you up that learning curve uh, to come in and help train your team for sure. Excellent. Thank you for that. Uh, next question. Um, what are some executive barriers to selling open source? In other words, I want to go to open source and now I have to sell it to my organization. Uh, what can those folks, what can those practitioners who have to sit there and convince those board members, you know, uh, what can they expect to hear when they're pitching this kind of technology? So I think that people are going to want to see a, um, uh, uh, people will, as with anything, they're going to want to see a total cost analysis. Um, and that can be a little bit more work to put together because, again, you're not just saying, oh, here's what the list price of the software is. You have to think about what the um, the human capital required to make the project successful is. And depending on you know how you're going to do your implementation, that can vary. Um, I think people are going to want to see... Um, you know what are the what are the real benefits that we're going to get from this? And um, uh, the the good news is that there's you know again as the the web in general moves in this direction, there are just an increasing number of instances where something exciting or delightful has happened, and you know what it was built with open source. Um, and uh, I think that being able to use proof points is is very powerful. So it's kind of like you've got to prove that you've got the um, you know the nuts and bolts under control, and that you're not. Um, open source, I think, sometimes has a reputation of being a little bit less organized. And so you prove that you've got your, your nuts and bolts in order, and you've got a good story for how much this costs, how much it gets supported. And then you show, here's the value we're going to get. Here's how much faster we'll get to market. Here's how much um, more we'll be able to do. And look, here are all these other instances of people doing this very successfully. 
Josh, thanks so much. And thank you, folks, for all those great questions. And Chris, we know you had another question in there. We'll try to get to that with you after the show. Hey, guys, that concludes it. The webinar has been recorded. Just to let you know, the video and recap article will be emailed to you and available on cmswire.com in a few days. Thanks again to Pantheon and Josh Koenig for the thought-provoking ideas. It was awesome. Uh, and thanks to Pantheon for sponsoring today's event. If your company is interested in sponsoring a webinar, please email us at advertising at cmswire.com. Hey, folks, thanks so much for tuning in. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks.